good evening everybody we've just had a little bit of a nervous breakdown as, as, as the lions went down but you're almost welcome to to tonight's livery uh committee literary evening um we've called assistant paul wilson who's used to seeing my left ear as he's just told me and he's quite frightened when he sees my whole face he'll talk to you about that in a minute i'm um, obviously our own p today for those that were with us last time you remember that i went through very quickly the objectives of the livery committee which is to represent uh, the views of our membership, which Peter Day does excellently, to raise money for the Stationers Foundation. I'm pleased to say that just two weeks ago, we made a check of 15,000 pounds to the foundation for the work and the events we had last year. And thirdly, to put on organize, uh, sorry, to organize events for the whole of the membership, which is why we're here tonight. Um, one of the ideas we had earlier in the year was to have a, a range of literary lunches. And we had the first one in October, and some of you were present in Williamson's Tavern when we had um, Simon Heffer come along. It was a really uh, interesting, interesting day. So now we're, we're actually having to move into virtual events. And the first one of those was uh, five or six weeks ago with Crystal McCain. And I'm pleased to say that we've had some really positive feedback from that. So thank you very much for everybody that attended that. And thank you even more for the feedback. So tonight we're, we're moving on to um, Paul and Peter's going to be covering that. Now, if you've got any questions, if you hit the chat button on there and put the questions through, uh, Peter and, and Lucy and myself will try to coordinate the, the questions for you. And as with our face-to-face -face meetings, you'll also have an opportunity to, to purchase the uh, publications that, that Paul's done. And I'll talk a little bit more about those later on. So tonight, as I said, it's not a literary lunch. It's a literary cocktail evening, so please charge your glasses, sit back, and listen to a conversation between Paul and Peter. So over to you, Peter. Hello, everybody. Very nice that we stationers are keeping books in the spotlight in these strange times. Uh, this evening, the author in question is Paul Wilson, who's somewhere here, one of the little boxes. Um, He's going to tell us mainly about his fairly recent new book, Hostile Money, Currencies in Conflict. Paul is, of course, a prominent stationer. He joined the company in 2010. Since then, he's chaired the Library and Archive Committee, the Heritage Committee and the Hall Committee. And very recently, he's joined the Hall Development Committee and the Vision 350 Steering Group. In both cases, he's deputy chairman. But he's rather a latecomer. For the writing of books and I want to hear Paul how you got to be a stationer because you started off in the army and I think you were seeking adventure. Um, yeah Peter seeking adventure in the army or by becoming a stationer? No well one after the other. The oh, first right, okay, thing yeah, was yeah, seeking, yeah. seeking adventure in the army weren't you? Yeah, you yeah. were young and you wanted to travel and do what? Well um, be what uh, just about the past three, gen four generations of my family have been, which is in the services, army or, or navy. So it was not a very, um, uh, how can I say, constructive or, or uh, unusual thing to do. It just ran in the genes. Um, and, uh, and so I spent 10 years in the army and, and a quarter of that time was learnt on long language courses. Um, so I was almost a permanent student uh, during my time in the army. Which is a good way to learn, isn't it? They know how to teach languages, don't they? Well, I think so. Yeah, I think they're pretty good at it. Yeah. Where did you go in the army? You ended up in Berlin before the wall came down, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, all the usual things, Northern Ireland and Cyprus and British Army of the Rhine. But the, um, the high point was Berlin. And I was very fortunate to be posted, as some people know, to a, a very odd organisation called Bricksmiths, which was the army's acronym for the british commander-in-chief's mission to the soviet forces in east germany so it was a a long-standing liaison organization designed to liaise between the british and soviet soviet armies just after the second world war and to defuse any tensions that might erupt between the two and it was uh, signed into being by the two commanders-in-chief in germany occupying germany uh the uh, the British commander in chief Robertson and his Soviet counterpart Malinovsky. So um, the organisation was designed partly to to liaise with um, certain Soviet officials, 
but uh, also I think it's well established that it was a licensed form of spying uh, because we and our American and French counterparts were doing all we could to photograph new Soviet tanks uh, or East German equipment and the Soviets in the uh, in the western zone were doing exactly the same to British American and French equipment so and it was it was uh, it was the Cold War but at a sort of tepid temperature any interesting encounters with particular people there well um, I think the most interesting account encounter that sort of deep in my uh, memory is um, shortly before I went on my first trip to East Germany there was a quite a serious um, incident when an American officer had overstepped the mark tried to get too close to a Soviet tank and got shot and killed and um, it hit the um, hit the headlines um, all around the world and I was out um, on my first tour of East Germany about 48 hours afterwards with very strict warnings um, you know to play everything very cautiously uh, and um, uh, the missions, the military missions, would always access East Germany across the famous Glienicke Bridge, uh, the Bridge of Spies, which is uh, best known for exchanges of spies, but not so well known as the as the point of en entry into East Germany for the um, for the military missions. And um, at that time, the, the killing of the American officer had become such a high-profile event that uh, the media were all over the Glienicke Bridge. And I remember. Charles Wheeler um, coming up to the um, coming up to our car and sort of poking a sort of microphone at us and trying to encourage us to to speak and we just looked the other way but that was quite interesting because Wheeler who himself was a very serious um, journalist I don't know whether you ever met him mm. Peter or, or whether uh, any of our other um, people from the world of the media met him but he was he was a very credible foreign affairs journalist and also had interestingly during the second world war had been um i think the second in command of something called 30 assault commando which had been set up by peter fleming so wheeler had a pretty good idea of what we were about uh but nevertheless we sort of you know turned the other way and and went across the bridge when it was our turn to go uh, so that was quite an interesting moment um and uh we went across and just played it very low key, low key at that time. After 10 years in the army, you then joined the diplomatic service. Was that doing the same thing by other means? No. <laughs> Gosh, I mean, look at me. Does this look like Daniel Craig, Peter? Honestly. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it was, it was all the standard stuff, desk bound research and analysis to start with, looking after um, some of the countries of Eastern Europe and then Southern Africa in the departments back in King Charles Street, then a posting to Pakistan, uh, to the High Commission there, a couple of years there looking after Afghanistan because there was no embassy in, uh, in Afghanistan at that time, and then back to the Eastern European um, uh, Department at a time when the Cold War was coming to an end and um, kind of fossils like me were becoming redundant because as we all know Russia was never ever going to be a threat again. What, what your languages? What were the languages you so, used? Uh, Russian and German, and uh, and some Persian as well. And then you had how long were you in the diplomatic service for then? A, a total of eight years. Um, so that's eight eighteen months, uh, years. And then you looked around for a job in Civvy Street, did you? That's right. Well, in fact, one sort of almost threw itself at me, and um, uh, it it really worked very well because not only was it involved in printing uh, which was of interest to me on a personal level uh, but um, it was um, uh, it, it had lots of interesting stuff to deal with it was basically Delarue where we were printing banknotes and passports for foreign countries so lots of exciting travel interesting developments and that kept me entertained for about another 20 years. Why was printing a personal interest? Oh, it just goes back to an interest in uh, early books, the printing, uh, early printing of books. Yeah, it's a hobby, really. Right. And um, your Dillaroo jobs taught you, well, obviously, a lot about money, currencies, and how they work in the real world, and what they actually are, because we take them for granted, but they're a little bit of a mystery when you start thinking about them, aren't they? Well, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've had 
plenty of time to think about how modern banknotes work and what is it exactly that enables us to place our trust in the modern banknotes. Um, up, up until, well, in the UK, up until 1931, the trust was based on the fact that money was backed by gold. And that was the case as well with the US dollar up to 1971. But since 71, there has been no real backing of money by any precious commodity like gold. And it's what we call a fiduciary currency. In other words, that's a fancy word used to describe the fact that we all place our faith in this little piece of paper uh, and that there is really little more behind it um, than the trustworthiness of the central bank and the government that issues it. And you were, as a De La Rue representative, getting governments to invent new money sometimes or to print their new money with you. Well, that's yeah, that was the, the primary objective. Um, you, you, you remind me uh, of the Conservative Minister Tim Egger, who led the first British trade mission to Turkmenistan after the uh, fall of the Soviet Union. And uh, I was with him at that, and he really helped uh, Delarue along by declaring to the cabinet of ministers in Turkmenistan that Delarue was the only company that really was in favor of inflation. So, you know. <laughs> Um, that uh, was just one of those uh, events where you really put on the spot. And you almost put me on the spot in the same way, Peter. We'll, we'll come to, we'll come to uh, in inflation in a minute when we, get, when we get onto the book. But let's think about your travelling just for a little while. What's your favourite place you've travelled a lot? Oh, well, it, it, it always goes back to Berlin, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, it was an exciting time and a great city to be in. And um, yeah. Berlin, without a doubt. Not all those deserts and things in the Middle East. No, they're interesting, you know, and uh, I'm glad I did them. But, um, you know, for a, a comfortable life and an interesting one, you'd have to go back to Berlin, I think. Where's your favourite? What's your favourite money? Where's it from? Uh, now, from a, a country, and there may be some people in the company who've been to this place, but I certainly haven't. And it's Cap Verde former Portuguese colony just off the um, west coast of uh, Africa and um, they have the most stunningly um, creative vivid colors creative designs um, and um, their some of their best designs were almost forced through Delarue against the wishes of some of the senior executives by a very strong-willed uh, regional sales manager who would never take no for an answer and would have the printers jumping through hoops to achieve exactly what he wanted to achieve. Um, so he set very high standards for a very creative and attractive set of designs and they've carried on since then. And it's almost the case that uh, the more obscure the country, if obscure isn't too unkind, the more obscure the country, the more attractive the designs, the more powerful the country, the more boring the designs. Now that, occur, that occurs in stamps as well, of course. I remember vividly from my stamp collecting days that the jazzy stamps were all issued by the most obscure countries. Some of them, I think, invented by Stanley Gibbons. <laughs> the countries or the stamps? The countries. Oh, right. <laughs> then they could sell the stamps. Um, you retired from De La Rue in 2015, and then you got involved with Iran. Yeah, well, I'd had some dealings with Iran in the past uh, because both Britain and Iran were interest, have traditionally been interested in Afghanistan for 200, over 200 years. And in Pakistan, I'd occasionally meet my Iranian counterparts and we'd go off and have a curry somewhere and talk about what was going wrong in Afghanistan. Um, and I'd studied some Persian um, in, in uh, Pakistan to help my work on Afghanistan. And um, I'd also been the Delarue person responsible for dealing with the sensitive issues surrounding Iran. So advising members of the company whether they could safely trade with Iran or whether they'd be sanctions busting. Um, so I was known to the British Iranian Chamber of Commerce and when I retired, they invited me to go there and sort of muck in. And that um, was how it came about. And, and, and it must be an extremely difficult job at the moment. What on earth do you do in the the hands-offness of uh, Iran? Well, it's, you know, 
it is permissible, it, it is legal for British companies to trade with Iran, as it is for all Europeans. Um, it is not permissible for Americans to trade with Iran, and there, therein lies the problem. So um, we are constantly working on how we can promote trade with Iran um, whilst avoiding you know, the worst detentions of the Americans. And this is, I've described it before, as the first, um, the first open split between British and American foreign policy since Suez. Um, and it's interesting because um, our current prime minister, when he was foreign minister, um, gave a joint press conference with the then US Foreign uh, Secretary of State, uh, Rex Tillerson. And Johnson at that time insisted that the Iranians had to have something in return for their adherence to the nuclear deal, and that something had to be trade. So that was the first divergence, um, and it was on Johnson's watch as foreign minister. So it's very difficult, um, and at the moment, a lot of it is about keeping a watching brief, looking out for um, what the US policy might be after the November elections. Uh, will Trump be re-elected? If he is, there'll be no improvement in si the situation for Iran. If he's not re-elected, there'll be some thaw, but it won't be that fast, I think. So it's a very, very delicate situation. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've gone on about that for a bit because uh, it's all the background to this book here, Hostile Money. A retirement project? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd started writing it in, in 2011. Um, in fact, I'd started writing a massive tome in 2011, um, which included all sorts of things relating to money and politics and diplomacy and conflict. Um, and uh, the final tome was so big that uh, my excellent agent told me, no, you've got to cut this up into more manageable pieces. So this is the first, and there'll be another one coming out before too long. What did you want to do with this? Because it's, it's it, it may have been cut down, but it still takes in a huge range of subjects and goes back and forward a long way, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I think um, I wanted to break new ground. I don't think anybody had gone in the same geographical range and period of time uh, into that that theme, what happens to money during conflict. There had been some very specific books. There's a very good one by an American economist on uh, monetary sanctions. There was a very curious book on currency and conquest written by a Russian just after the Second World War. And his politics are uh, a bit suspect through that because he almost comes across as so anti-Soviet that he might be inclining towards the side of the Germans and the Italians in the war. So uh, what I wanted to do was to uh, produce something that was wider ranging geographically and get, went back over a longer period and see if we could flush out some, uh, some lessons that keep on emerging from, from currency in conflict. Okay, let's have a lesson. Oh, okay, just like that. <laughs> well, I think um, there's a very interesting quote that uh, I cite in the book and it's usually attributed to J.M. Keynes, the um, leading economist, talking about Lenin. And in that quote, the, the theory goes, that Lenin said, the way to destroy capitalism is to debauch its money. Well, whether it was said by, um, by Lenin or by Keynes, it simply isn't true. Uh, you can wreck the currency systems through inflation or hyperinflation, but it simply doesn't destroy capitalism or any of the basic the basic uh, way we operate. Um, and in fact, there have been plenty of examples of currency systems going down the tubes um, during war and people just keep on going. They survive somehow, they accept vastly hyperinflated currencies. Um, and, uh, and it's not the currency crash that makes the difference. What really stops a regime in its tracks is military power. And I think we saw that very much during the era of Blair's wars and um, Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, Iraq. And yet you started off, you start off with the example of the Chinese uh, inflation happening because a vast army had to be paid for and it was jolly expensive. So if you cheapened the currency in some way, you could pay people ostensibly more. So 
um, if you start inflating, inflating too much, then um, you get into terrible trouble with the people you're paying with this deflating currency, don't you? Well, that's, that's absolutely true. And that is one of the, one of the lessons, which is that um, if you're going to um, turn a blind eye to inflation, if you're going to almost stoke inflation in your country, you have to be very careful about how you handle the military because in many countries, it's not the case in Brit Britain, at least it hasn't been the case in England since the middle of the 17th century, the army is very much out of politics. Well, that's not the case in places like Zimbabwe and Venezuela. And in both those cases, there's been horrific hyperinflation. And uh, the way the regimes have stayed in power is by buying the, buying the military. So in Zimbabwe, and this is a case uh, covered in the, in the book, um, the, uh, the regime, uh, first of all, had to start paying the military in US dollars and even take it to the barracks to prevent them going onto the streets and rioting. So you do have to keep bribing the military, but when you bribe them, you have to bribe them with solid money. You can't bribe them with some worthless, um, hyperinflated currency. And Venezuela has had a different approach to this. Venezuela reputedly has bought off the senior generals by allowing them to engage, engage in monopolies of business and so on, uh, through which they're probably earning US dollars. Um, so, you know, you have to be really careful about, you ha about the way you handle your military. It is extraordinary the way ordinary people, not military people, muddle through during a great inflation. You mentioned, of course, the the great German inflation of the early 1930s, but that wasn't the biggest one, was it? And I, I actually uh, got caught up in the, uh, I think the biggest one in Yugoslavia in the 90s, uh, was well, it think... the 90s or the 80s, um, when people just went on to other things and grew a lot of vegetables and that kind of stuff. Ordinary people muddled through in this extraordinary way. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's another lesson. Um, in fact, the the worst hyperinflation was Hungary in 1945, oh, yeah. when um, yeah. the Soviet troops who entered Hungary then simply took control of the uh, print works and and just pumped out loads of Hungarian um, banknotes with ludicrously large denomination numbers on them, much worse than Germany in the 20s. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the people will essentially make up, the market makes up its own mind, whether it wants to accept currency or not. And at some point, uh, people can get so fed up with it that they'll say, I'm just not going to accept that local currency anymore. Um, and in fact, when Zimbabwe tried to correct its appalling hyperinflation, it tried to introduce a digital currency and people simply turn their backs on it very quickly. Uh, it, you, the currency must command the respect of the people. Uh, when I was in Yugoslavia, I remember they were running out of great people to put on the um, on the notes they were printing. Yeah, well, That's yeah. Said to be a real problem then. Um, reserve currencies, the US dollar, we had the pound as a reserve currency for such a long time. They're both a boon and a blessing, aren't they? Well, I think that's that's very true. Um, you know, people quite often make mistakes in running the reserve currency. So the Americans um, uh, were in the, a very clearly dominant position between 1945 and 1971 and backed their US dollars with gold uh, throughout that period. But the stresses of running the Vietnam War and running some very high spending domestic uh, programs uh, just um, made it impossible for them to uh, issue currency or enough currency to be backed by gold. They simply didn't have enough gold um, in Fort Knox. So they came off the gold standard in, um, in 1971. Of course, we'd come off it in 1931. But people continue to trust the um, American currency still, so that it's it's something like 40 to 50 percent of reserves around the world. And that is based almost entirely on things like the size of the U.S. market, um, the, size, the general size of the U.S. economy, uh, the belief that the U.S. market and economy is properly run. Um, 
uh, and so it's again this question of faith we have a faith in that currency and that faith is now being challenged by the fact that the chinese are enormous holders of dollars and things are getting tricky between the americans and the chinese particularly about trade which is what currencies are all about so there are problems building up there for the american reserve currency aren't there well there are but it's a bit like that story that you hear you know if you owe the bank um you know ten thousand pounds it's your problem but if you owe them 10 million pounds it's their problem now the uh, the chinese have amassed such a huge value in their reserves of us uh, dollars uh, and that will be as much as anything else in securities um, that they cannot afford to see the US dollar collapse. It is in their interests to ensure that the US dollar at present retains its value. Um, now, in the long run, uh, there are a lot of people, not least in America, saying, you know, how long can we allow this to go on for? We've really got to start thinking about an alternative to the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. And I've recently spoken to some very serious people, uh, one of whom was a long-term IMF man. And he believes that the, um, the US dollar needs to be replaced by an alternative. Which alternative? Well, I think the starting point is something that, that few people look at uh, who are not economists. And that is um, the so-called special drawing rights. It's the uh the imf's kind of reserve fund uh which consists of a basket of currencies and it includes the us dollar obviously um the euro still the pound sterling i think we account for about eight percent of the total um the japanese yen and the uh, uh, chinese renminbi has been admitted in uh in recent years in the past year and a half or so so that gives you what that does uh, is first of all it hedges currencies against each other it means you haven't got all your eggs in in the basket of one reserve currency but also it depoliticizes the currency so that um, you know if, if you're only holding US dollars you are very subject to changes in US policy if the US doesn't like you as a country they might switch off your ability to access the US dollar markets in the US. And that's precisely what they've done with Iran and precisely what they've done with Venezuela. Yeah, but as soon as you get to special drawing rights, then you get onto these new sorts of currencies. We'll come on to electronic ones in a minute. Um, these new sorts of currencies that uh, are so difficult for ordinary people who understand money or think they do, don't understand anything about um, uh, this invented sort of money because you don't have notes in it, do you? You're talking about digital currencies. Well, I'm coming to that in a minute. I'm talking about special drawing rights of oh, right. the incomprehensible to ordinary people. Yeah, I, I think. But this, the the starting point for special drawing rights is as a reserve currency for central banks. Instead of holding their um, reserves in U.S. dollars or euros, they would then start to hold them in uh, special drawing rights. And it's never been entirely clear to me why um, there hasn't been a steady and measured move in that direction. It may be but the, that the US still has so much clout um, at the IMF that they can prevent a move in that direction. Certainly the, um, the American uh, voting power at the IMF was so strong in the 50s that basically they bought the Suez invasion to a halt by threatening to block Britain's access to its IMF reserves and selling uh, sterling on the open market. So it was the most notable exercise of monetary sanctions against the country, one ally against another. SDRs would not be um, something that the public would uh, dabble in to start with, but it is a means of backing uh, currencies issued by central banks. I suppose for a lot of the time we don't think very much about currency crises, but when they happen, when the pound, say, is falling at a certain time, then it's um, politically extremely frightening, isn't it? I think so. And yet, at the same time, I'm not entirely sure that, um, that vast masses of politicians necessarily understand the way currencies work. 
and how to get the best out of them. So um, I was having at one stage quite a lot of conversations with um, uh, a Labour uh, man who was for a short time a, minister, a shadow minister in, um, in Corbyn's uh, uh, crew, but for all that had been uh, parliamentary private secretary in the previous Labour government. And, you know, it was a very decent man. But um, interestingly, he, come, he represented a constituency which was really strong in exports. I mean, a real powerhouse in exports. And uh, at one point, the pound fell quite dramatically. And he said to me, I'm really worried about falling the pound. To which I said to him, well, look, you're, that will really boost exports from your constituency. You know, had you thought about that? And it's clear that he hadn't. And that's not a criticism of him. I don't think that there are that many political figures who really are steeped in uh, currency operations or in or in economics. And so why should we expect the general public to be um, really, you know, steeped in that kind of knowledge? Well, you can ignore it altogether, the pound in your pocket in that famous Harold Wilson quotation, the pound in your pocket has not been devalued. But of course, it hits you in all sorts of ways when you go abroad, when you buy something from abroad, um, uh, that you don't think about in that, that glib phrase that bat, bats criticism away. Yeah, I think, I think that is right. I mean, as a whole, uh, we are an importing um, country. Um, our trade balance with the rest of the world has been negative since... I don't know how long, you probably know better than I do, Peter, you must do. Uh, but, um, yeah. sorry? Decades. Yeah. Decades. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, it is very important to us that we have a stable and reasonably strong, but not too strong, um, currency. Uh, because if we're having to buy all our food in from overseas, we need to be able to, you know, buy it with a, with a firm currency. We cannot afford to have sterling slip too far but at the same time if you have too strong a currency it will kill exports so you know the bank of england really has this challenge on its hand to kind of find the right balance in terms of strength and weakness of sterling to satisfy both exporters and importers on something else entirely waterloo and portugal the stationers were involved in that weren't they well, the, uh, an eminent stationer was involved with that. So John Waterlow, the late John Waterlow, who died within the past year or two, um, his grandfather was uh, master of the stationer's company, uh, ran Waterlow and Sons, the banknote printing company, um, and eventually went on to be Lord Mayor of London. So he was a pretty big figure, um, both in the city and in the banknote printing business. But he was turned over uh, royally by a Portuguese con man in the 20s. Um, and um, it's an extraordinary story. I mean, it's been the subject of, um, of one or two books. Why it's never been made into a film, I don't know. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, this con man persuaded John Waterloo that um, he was fully authorised to place an order for Portuguese banknotes um, on Waterloo's who were the uh, existing contract holders. So uh, Waterloo agreed to print for them. The man took delivery of the banknotes and used it to start setting up his own bank in Portugal and eventually started buying shareholdings in the National Bank of Portugal, which at that time was a privately owned organisation. And he was getting quite close to the point where he would have pretty well a controlling share. And then it all came out. Uh, the whole thing fell apart. Um, he was uh, arrested and convicted. Uh, the Portuguese right, the sort of military plus some fascists, used it as an excuse to seize power in Portugal. And Waterloo's never really recovered. Um, after that and eventually the company faded and, and died and was bought out in the 60s. It's an extraordinary story um, and John Waterloo and I used to sort of chat about it whenever we'd meet um, uh, and have a, a bit of a wry smile about it. Are the many currency crises in this book a warning for the future? Um, 
that money crises are always just around the corner? I think the I think the warning is this that um, hostile countries, hence the name of the book, hostile countries will use currency as a means of attacking another country, whether it's through uh, relatively peaceful sanctions or counterfeiting. Uh, and I include a uh, coverage of a rather well-known counterfeiting episode, um, which has been going on probably since about the 1980s, involving some people say North Korea and the US dollar. So people the use $100 counterfeiting. Bill. The $100, the, yeah, the hundred dollar bill. bill, the so-called super dollar. Um, so, so one hostile, one country which is hostile to another will often use currency as a means of getting its own back, getting an attack in uh, on uh, whichever country it dislikes. That happens particularly during war. The, the best example probably is the famous Operation Burnout counterfeits that have been the subject of films. Um, but I think for all of us now, um, absolutely everybody um, should be thinking about an alert to one thing, and that is that um, the internet enables us to access money and carry out transactions with ease and convenience in no way uh, as complicated as it used to be before. We can just wave a card at a machine now, it's so easy. But for as much as you make a system easy, you also make it very vulnerable. And the, we, we know from everything we've been hearing about hacking, we know that there are plenty of attacks uh, on the UK and on America. And these are, in many cases, they are uh, either low level criminal attacks through the internet, or in some cases, they are state sponsored attacks uh, perhaps to fiddle with election results or to encourage change in public perceptions through social media. It's going on all over the place. But what we haven't seen is a really major currency attack by means of a cyber attack through the internet. There've been a few, uh, but they've been relatively low key. There was, a, there was an attack on the Bank of Philippines um, holdings in the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and that again is believed to have been carried out by North Korea and they siphoned off something like 80 or 90 million dollars. But quite honestly, that is small fry compared to what could be achieved if a really seriously capable state, and there are probably two at least out there, decided they wanted to wreck uh, another country's economy and they would do it by means of a seriously large uh, cyber attack. And economic warfare might be far more effective than any bombs, or most bombs. Well, look at look at the um, the effect of COVID. Um, you could say that it has had a more direct effect on the economy and on society over the past four months than um, perhaps you know the wars that have that Britain's been engaged with in in uh, the Far East in the Middle East. Uh, and 30 years of um, Operation Banner, the Northern Irish campaign. It's almost brought the um, economy to its knees. So the economy now is perhaps increasingly the weak point for a country. If you go back to the, um, to the Second World War, the First World War, um, and even to the Napoleonic Wars, this country was taking an absolute pounding in terms of debt. The debts accrued during those wars were over 100%, in some cases, 200, 250% of GDP. But it was accepted at the time and the country recovered and paid off all its debts. But the, the effect of COVID has been a really shattering blow to the economy. Uh, and so if you're saying an attack on the economy can now be more effective than isolated instances of bombings, then I'd, I would agree with you. There's the other element, the sort of retail element, uh, a denial of service attack on the banking infrastructure as experienced through ATMs and, um, and, and ch uh, cash machines uh, would be a very shocking thing for a whole population, wouldn't it? That's right. I mean, there is a, a distinction to be drawn between, on the one hand, the attack 
on the Central Bank of Philippines, which siphoned off $80 million. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, an attack which attempts to stop people accessing their money, not necessarily to divert it into the accounts of a, a hostile government, but simply to, to seize up, to gum up the works of the currency system. And imagine if we couldn't not only not get money out of our ATM machines, and I don't know about you, but I'm using ATMs very rarely at the moment, um, but imagine if we couldn't carry out transactions through our account using uh, online computer payments or, you know, waving exactly. a card at a machine. Yeah, and that, and that would be really shocking. And I would have thought it's almost inevitable. We've created a new nervous system for the world in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. It's going to suffer from a nervous breakdown at some stage, either small or large. It must do. It, we lay ourselves open to it. We've certainly made ourselves vulnerable to it. And I, I don't have confidence. I shouldn't perhaps be worrying people too much, but I don't have confidence that commercial banks will take the necessary levels of um, security, will we'll introduce the necessary measures for security to prevent an attack by a seriously hostile country. Um, I think that has to be in the hands of the Bank of Bank of England and the government to introduce those sort of measures and impose them. And of course, the Bank of England has been running um, uh, sort of war games on this, haven't they? The, yeah, well, they certainly um, did run one um, perhaps about two or three years ago. Um, but some of the information leaked out of it leads one to believe that it wasn't exhaustive, that it was a relatively lightweight thing. And um, again, it's worth knowing that prior to Northern Rock's collapse in 2007, the Treasury and the Bank of England had run a, uh, a test, a scenario, an exercise in which they considered the possibility that a commercial bank, there would be a run on a commercial bank. And they worked through the whole scenario and concluded at the end of it that it was improbable as it hadn't happened for 150 years. Mm. And then it happened. Uh, now, there isn't much in the book about the euro. Um, a currency very close to home, a currency designed to prevent conflict after two world wars in a single century. Um, question from Paul Pinder, uh, come in while, we were while we've been talking. Um, the Euro, Euro economy is uh, getting on for the size of the American economy. Why is the Euro not more of a candidate to uh, replace or, or come alongside the dollar? And um, my question is, is the euro going to survive? Well, okay, to take, take Paul's first. Yeah. Um, the euro was designed partly just to facilitate um, trade within Europe. And personally, I, I suspect that that's pretty well worked to the German advantage uh, or the Northern Europeans advantage. Um, but um, I think it's a question of confidence. Uh, there still isn't sufficient confidence in the EU and the Euro to convince people that they should hold more Euros than dollars in their central bank reserve accounts. Um, and when you see um, the struggles that the European Union has had to deploy a unified policy on matters like uh, handling refugee flows across the Mediterranean, or how to deal with the impact of the sovereign debt crisis in 2009, um, and indeed how to handle COVID, then it undermines confidence, not only confidence in the EU, but confidence in the currency as well. I think the, what, what has been apparent over the past 12 years is that whenever you get a crisis that really tests the EU, uh, different states go off in different directions. They do different things. They'll suspend Schengen or they'll su suspend things like the so-called Stability and Growth Pact because it protects the French and the Germans from criticism. So, you know, the, um, the EU, I think, has got to prove itself as a union. I, at the moment, I continue to think of it as a confederation rather than a union. And, and that answers, I think, some way your 
your question, uh, Peter, will it survive? I, I struggle to think it's surviving in its current form uh, indefinitely. I think that um, in order to survive long term, they will have to create political structures which prevent nation states from going off in whatever direction they want to when the going gets tough. Uh, as we have done, that leads to another question from Tony Mash about uh, what happens to the pound when we are finally really out of the um, out of uh, Europe. I know we weren't part of the euro, but we were part of Europe, and we ain't going to be any more. What happens to the pound then? Well, it'll be in, entirely, uh, I think, a consequence of um, how successful Britain is outside of the. Um, uh, of the European Union. Uh, it, Brexit was sold to us on the basis that we would be uh, primarily financially stronger. We would be able to cut our own deals wherever we wanted to uh, and so on. Now, if that's proven to be um, uh, a red herring uh, or, or simply not the case and the economy struggles, then we must expect to see the pound struggle. We live in interesting times, don't we? And of course we have now technology companies. You mentioned you didn't think the, the banks were that good perhaps at te technology, but the technology companies, the giants, are becoming more powerful in the data in particular that they have about us and all seeing than most countries, aren't they? This is a fantastic transfer of, um, of overseeing power. Well, it, it is, and, and some central banks are seeing it as a threat as well, particularly those um, technology companies, social media platforms that want to introduce your, their own uh, currencies. So Facebook's uh, Libra was seen uh, in a very negative light in the US, and a number of central banks have been saying about digital currencies in general that they're a threat to sovereignty sovereignty of the central bank well what they really mean is not so much sovereignty but control that's what they're worried about uh, and for that reason a lot of central banks are now starting to look at introducing their own alternative centrally issued national digital currencies which could in time presumably take over from banknotes as the principal principal currency issued by a, a bank a central bank what's happened to Libra and Facebook. I haven't heard much about it in the last year or so. No, I haven't heard very much. But uh, what I can say is that uh, there were uh, a handful of currency experts who were quite keen on the idea. They're sort of more on the libertarian end of things. They like to see, they'd like to see money disentangled from the state if they can. Uh, but some of those who are cautiously libertarian wanted to see Libra backed by SDRs, special drawing rights. So we come back to special drawing rights as a potential solution for the future. What about Bitcoin? I don't like things like Warren Buff Buffett, the great investor. I don't like things I don't understand. And I really don't understand Bitcoin, which is a currency apparently created not to be understood. What about Bitcoin and blockchain, the, the, one of the technologies yeah, behind yeah. it? Is, is this a thing of the future or is it a snare and delusion, a great bubble that will bust inevitably? Well, uh, for me, the big problem with Bitcoin is not only is it difficult to understand, <clears throat> but we don't actually know who is, who is so-called mining it. Um, some people say, well, that anonymity adds to the attraction and it's beyond the reach of the state and so on. But if uh, we don't know who's issuing this stuff or generating it, how can we possibly have confidence in them? Would you have confidence in a uh, currency issued by an organization that you don't know? You know, you don't recognize them as a commercial bank or as a central bank. Um, you know, my personal view is that Bitcoin's problem is precisely its hard sell uh, on the basis of the anonymity of blockchain. But blockchain, uh, a lot of people say blockchain, oh, that technology is going to um, uh, revolutionize all kinds of financial activity. Now, that's sound, even if Bitcoin is not. Well, but, but blockchain, um, I think, is, is based on two points, and that is, uh, well, maybe, maybe three points. One is that 
um, a limited amount of currency can be generated using the system. Therefore, you can't over create money and therefore it will hold back hyperinflation. That is a, uh, that is a key point. Uh, the second point is its anonymity and its, um, its uh, the fact that it is one removed from government control. Um, and, and I think these, you know, these technologies might be attractive. And I think possibly a lot of central banks might decide we'll adopt a form of this, but they're not going to allow the national currency to be generated by a lead of anonymous um, IT geeks, uh, you know, doing it in their basement cellar. Are they? I would hope not, but uh, uh, we live in a world where technology is constantly astonishing us. Um, uh, Past Master Kevin Dewey has a question about Scotland, something close to home. If Scotland goes, goes its own way, gets independence, is it practical for Edinburgh still to be involved with the, um, the pound sterling? Ah, um, that's also um, features in my next book. Um, <clears throat> the the original preference for the uh, Nats, the SNP, was simply to be continue to be part of a sterling union, and um, George Osborne killed that idea. So that was dead in the water. Um, and since then, they've been looking around for alternative ideas, and the last thing that they've really hit on is the idea of allowing uh, sterling to uh, circulate for a while, albeit without control. They would have no say in the interest rates uh, or in the management of sterling. But they would allow sterling to uh, circulate for a while and allow commercial banks con to continue to issue notes north of the border. Uh, and they're taking a little bit of their cue from Ireland because that's exactly what Ireland did between 1921 and 26. Mm -hmm. It was only in 26 that the Irish started issuing their own currency or working on the currency design. So, so parallel circulation of sterling and of commercial banknotes for a transitional period. Then the so-called Scott pound will come in, and the idea is to back that with sterling. The question is, um, Scotland has run up reputedly the second highest debt to GDP uh, level in Europe. So it's, it's suggesting that their management of economy is uh, subject to question. Um, if they uh, cannot run the economy with a, a, a tight rein, uh, will they stick with sterling backed Scott pounds or Will they start generating more and more currency in order to in order to pay government bills effectively? Um, so, you know, Kevin, there is a, there are grounds for thinking they'll try and replicate the Irish situation between 1921 and 26, and then once they start issuing their own currency, uh, that will be the point at which we'll see whether they've got the discipline to run a national currency or not. Um, the, other, the other interesting point there, of course, is that, um, and I've made this point, is that um, if they're going to allow um, Scottish uh, commercial banks to run uh, and issue currencies north of the border, they will need to have sterling reserves to back those, those banknotes because all of the Royal Bank of Scotland, Bank of Scotland, Clydesdale notes are covered one pound for one pound at the moment, every pound issued by Royal Bank of Scotland north of the border, there is another pound uh, resting in the Bank of England. If the Scots want the commercial banks to allow those banknotes to circulate north of the border, they have to move their, uh, their reserves north of the border. And I think that that's very questionable whether the um, RBS, which has just recently rebranded its holding company to NatWest, I think it's doubtful that those um, banks will take the risk of moving their sterling reserves north, especially when they saw uh, that the way they were rescued the last time round was by a combination of the Treasury and the Bank of England. It's safer to keep their money uh, south of the border. Well, those so are some of the ideas um, started, hairs started running by hostile money, this book, um, but uh, of course you're 
uh, coming back to uh, talk to the stationers about another book of yours. Uh, the, the book is Pilgrim's Prophet and Print, The Stationers of London and the English Settlement of North America. And you're giving a history lecture on the 22nd of December. To the stationers, uh, the printers, the priest, and the Indian princess. Just in a nutshell, a tiny little taster of what you're going to tell us then, please. Well, um, the taster is this, that um, uh, there was a sort of the equivalent of a Jacobean rock star visited um, St. Martin's. I think we're pretty confident she visited St. Martin's in 1616 um, and met the, uh, met the rector. And the rector was an extraordinary uh, character called Samuel Perkis, who uh, edited and wrote a massive, um, a massive book bringing together all the travelogues of the time, all the extraordinary stories of travelers from around the world. Uh, and it was a, a first in many ways. Uh, it covered lots of exciting new things that nobody had heard about. Um, and uh, she, uh, she came to visit him because he was interested in her story and the story of her people. Um, and I also want to touch on the story of the, the publisher and the printer who helped him to uh, create this, this book. Um, it's a book, by the way, that I've described as the largest printed in England uh, up to that point. Somebody else has said, do you mean the longest or the biggest? Well, I'm still not quite sure what I should be saying, but it was- You'll work it time... out by September anyway. Sorry? You'll work it out by September. By that time, I hope so. Yeah, so that's the, that's the story. That's on the 22nd of December, another Se event. September. Uh, uh, September. Thank you ever so much, um, uh, Paul, uh, for just some of the ideas that uh, uh, are coming up in this, uh, this hefty book, which is not as hefty as it would have been if your agent hadn't intervened. Thank you very much indeed. Back to Mike. Thanks, guys. That was absolutely fascinating. It's amazing how quickly an hour can go, isn't it? Um, Paul, you seem to have many more hours in your day than I do. I don't know how you managed to, to do it all. And as you know, um, I was very lucky, as some of us were, to be in Berlin with you uh, last year. And, and the stories you got from Berlin, especially when we also had Michael Binion, who was a court assistant at the time, who was a Times correspondent as well. Just an absolutely amazing trip. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, Paul. Um, as I said at the beginning, you'll you have the opportunity to buy the book. And the book is Hostile Money. Um, it's at £17 if you collect it from uh, the hall or an additional £5 post and packaging. And then all the profits are going to the delivery committee and the Stationers Foundation. Um, Paul will gladly sign, sign the book for you, so please um, email Lucy or myself. Now, if Paul does sign the book for you, perhaps he'll write something a little bit different than that he did in my book, which says, To my good friend Mike, alongside whom I have spent many tense days in the court, now, when my daughter got hold of that, she really wanted to say, Dad, what are you doing in court? Well, it took a while to explain, but as we said earlier, Paul usually sees my left ear as he sits next to me in court, so um, that explains that one. Um, our next cocktail hour will be with Margaret Wills on, on September the 3rd. We sadly had to cancel the planned lunch at Williamson's Taverns on September the 10th, and uh, hopefully I've contacted everybody that had booked for that, but hopefully you'll join us then on September the 3rd, when we hope, Peter and myself, to at least be in the hall with, with Margaret, but that depends on all sorts of, of regulations, so at least you'll be able to see the hall that day. So Margaret will be talking about her, her life, her excellent books, and also her newly published book, which is called The Domestic Herbal. Then on Wednesday the 21st of October, we're in conversation with Jonathan Drury on his book, and his career, his book is Around the World in 80 Trees, so... Um, Excellent um, stuff to be looking forward to. Lucy is recorded um, tonight, and you should be able to see that on YouTube and the company website um, very soon. So it just remains for me to say thank you, Lucy, for your support. Thank you, uh, Paul and Peter. Um, that was absolutely amazing. And thank you to everybody for, for joining us, and I really hope that you've enjoyed this evening. And, and just to say to enjoy the rest of your evening in these very strange times. Thanks, everybody, and good night.